Hey, good morning to you. It's Daybreak at iFiber One News Radio. I'm Jeff Slecky. Hope you're having a good start to your day. We're starting to move into the holiday season, and great performances are all around our community. I got a great guest in studio right now to talk about one such set of performances coming up before too long. Matt Blagan, good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. It's been good. a while since we've seen you here on the air. You've been busy, I know. Talk a little bit about that uh, with the uh, great brand uh, chorale and the youth chorale. You have got the Messiah performances coming up on we the do. 17th in Seattle and the 19th here in Shelton. Tell me a little bit about these. Uh, sure. Well, you know, we're launching the, organi the new organization with these performances, and uh, I'm really excited about them. They... Um, they involve uh, quite a few local singers. Uh -huh. um, the age range is from uh, 79 to age six. Wow. Um, the youngest is my son, uh, who will be singing his first Messiah this year. Nice. So that's kind of exciting for me too. I bet. Um, yeah, we're uh, really, you know, we've got some great collaborators. Um, we have a really rock star uh, cast of soloists who are joining us, um, who are all friends. Uh, one of whom has performed quite a bit here in Mason County uh, with me in the past, but the other three will be new to Mason County, which is really great. And with the soloists, it's kind of a different take on the traditional Messiah that you may have heard over the years, over the 275 we're, years. Yeah, we're doing, yeah, I mean, it's the same traditional um, soprano, alto, tenor, bass soloists. However, a uh, couple things that we're exploring that we're doing differently. Um, so there are, Handel never stopped composing Messiah. You know, he premiered it in 1742 and then he continued to rewrite it for most of the next 14 years. And what he, the reason he would do that is that in different places, there would be different soloists or different orchestral forces available to sure. him. And so he would rework things based on, oh, I have a killer alto here. I'm gonna, you know, rework this soprano aria or this bass aria and give it to that person. Um, so as a result, by the time he died in 1759, there, well, there, there are many more than these 11 movements, but there are 11 movements that actually have very easily um, sourced alternative parts. And so um, we, about a century ago, settled into sort of a traditional sequence. Yeah. But prior to that, um, it would be a mix and match, you know, based on the forces you have available and what you want to explore. And so... Uh, part of my doctoral research was to really look at what Handel's intentions were, um, because he was, just like all musicians of all times, subject to what his supporters and donors wanted him to do. Uh -huh. um, and so there are some really clear, if you look at the, 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 the notes in his scores when he conducted the work, and he conducted it a lot, it was the very last thing he ever conducted in his life, um, you can see what his choices were. And we don't use most of those movements anymore. Huh. And I think that's kind of interesting, particularly in the, the middle portion which is the passion portion of the peach piece um, that's where you know we have uh, the last week of Christ's life and um, some of the most exciting music in the oratorio and he and the librettist Charles Jennings had a major war for years about what should happen right before the evangelists go out to spread the good news and Jennings thought that that should be just a huge victory cho chorus and so that's normally what we perform it's a big chorus called their sound has gone out um, however Handel's preference was um, this happens in the sequence right before uh, the evangelists go out and then you know none of them have a very happy ending they all right. end up martyred uh -huh. and so and that, that 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 next aria is why do the nations so furiously reject and that's about that so Handel's take on that was to not do it as a chorus but do it as a very simple 22 bars solo tenor with just cello the most meek vulnerable thing you have ever heard and it's I've never heard it performed there's a beautiful duet and chorus before that that is the oldest music in, in Messiah. He wrote it when he was in his 20s, first having moved to England for some other purposes for the royal court, but never used it. And so we know it now as the my primary theme for how beautiful are the feet. But his preferred version of it wasn't the soprano version or the alto version that we know. It was a duet version for two altos, followed by a chorus that is almost never performed called Break Forth into Joy. So people are really going to get a... a a unique experience with these performances. Well, particularly because, you know, the modern sequence that we're used to 
settled in around s between 1745 and 1750, mostly in 1750 because of one person. And that was a very, very famous uh, castrato called uh, Gaetano Guadagni. And so a lot of the arias that are the reason that people go to Messiah were written specifically for or rewritten for Guadagni. And so we have, a, we have the hottest countertenor on the West Coast who's joining us um, and who's going to be performing a bunch of those Guadagni arias. So we're doing a little mix and match. We're doing some of the premier movements that are never done, that were only done in 1742 to 1745. And then we're doing some of the ones that you've been familiar with, but we're doing it with a real countertenor voice so you get a sense of what that would have sounded like 275 wow. years ago. Wow. So there are a couple of uh, performances here. The 17th in Seattle at the Plymouth Church. The yes. 19th here in Shelton at St. Edward's Catholic Church. Yes. Uh, and then in May, and we'll talk about those as they move forward there. Uh, so you were mentioning the uh, tenor and the counter tenor, Jose Luis Munoz. And how did you get involved with these folks? All, all of the all the featured artists. <laughs> They're friends. They're just friends. <laughs> They're friends. They yeah, this. yeah. Actually, that was exactly it. I'll tell you, you know, in the past when I've done Messiah, here I've always used uh, local soloists with the yeah. exception of Tess um, because she's always been involved in my local work here uh, so um, so Tess has been a longtime friend for 15 20 years uh, that's our soprano soloist um, Eric Neville who is our Grammy winning tenor soloist um, we're very lucky to have in the Pacific Northwest um, he's one of the hottest tenors in the world right now particularly in this country both as an opera soloist and as a choral musician which is unusual um, and uh, he's one of the nicest guys in the world so we did our doctoral degrees together so we were in school together um, we've done a bunch of work together regionally over the last couple of years um, and we're lucky to be keeping him in Seattle because his wife is one of the principal ballerinas at PNB Wow and so uh, Eric's just terrific so I it was funny I, I tell was singing in Germany this summer when I thought, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to do local soloists or professional soloists? And what I want is professional soloists who are not just professional soloists, but who are teaching artists, who will be excited about coming and working with local community musicians. And so um, so I emailed Tess. She emailed me back in the middle of the night in Germany <laughs> right away saying, I'm thinking about doing this. I know you're probably busy. Your career is really taken off, but I can't do this without asking you first because uh -huh. you're such a good friend. She's like, oh my God, I'm free. I want to do this. Who else have you got? And I'm like, okay, well, Jose Luis has been reaching out saying, can we do a Messiah? Can we do a Messiah? And he actually started the conversation two years ago. I was like, okay. You know, she's like, oh, well, call Eric. I'm like, Eric, he's kind of a rock star. I don't like, I mean, he's a friend and, you know, I'd love to have him over, to, you know, but really? And, you know, within... And so, and then she's like, who about for bass? I'm like, well, Charles Stevens has been wanting to, she's like, oh yeah, 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 that'd be, a... within 10 minutes, I had sent the emails out and gotten an enthusiastic reply saying, yeah, absolutely, we'll come wow. do this. And I'm like, you realize this is in Shelton, right? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Tess says it's really fun to sing in Shelton. I'm like, okay. So, uh, so that came together really quickly. It was all like okay. yeah, within an hour on a Monday in July. Oh my gosh. So how can folks find tickets here? I'm online at uh, greatbenmusic.org, which we'll talk about in, the, in a second second that's where we go and click on tickets yes. and get those performances there okay so tell me now about great bend and and the work you're doing there yeah our goal is, is is really twofold you know on the surface we look like a performing arts organization and that's really really great um however the the purpose is and the goal of my board and i um and we've been talking about this for a couple of years and my board is um representative drew McEwen, uh county commissioner kevin Schutte, um chamber executive director heidi uh, mccutcheon um and several others and our, our our long-term vision is twofold. Um, one is we'd like to develop some cultural tourism infrastructure that really drives more traffic through the county in the off season. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking for cultural attractions. And this is based in research that Commissioner Janie Kamen actually had done about wow. 14, 15 years ago, yeah. really sort of looking at where the best economic opportunity was for us as a county going forward. And we kind of feel like the time is right. There are some issues there, but we have, we have some hopes about developing a venue, um, a year-round venue that we would build over the next 10 years. Um, but prime the primary purpose, you know, so that, that would be have a, a significant economic impact. And that's one of the, I think, the benefits of being a smaller community because just a few hundred extra people coming on a weekend in January is a, is a significant yeah. hit for our small businesses, particularly yeah. in the hospitality industry. So if we can do that, that's a, that's a real boon. Um, but additionally, you know, my doctoral research is really focused on, um, in 2008, in the wake of the um, last financial crisis, um, there was a really interesting study by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation that looked at 
why can you know it wanted to just figure out which communities are showing the most resilience and they didn't know what they were going to find so they used this instrument this hundred some odd page instrument that just sort of measured everything that was happening in a community and the clearest trend was communities with the highest degree of arts participation were showing the most economic resilience hmm. and but nobody could explain why. And it was very consistent with decades worth of research showing that high degree of arts participation was related to lower health care costs, happier seniors, better PTAs, higher rates of voting, uh, all these really great things that are always community development goals in terms of civic engagement. Yeah. But no one had ever explained why that happens when there's a high degree of arts participation. And so that's what I went to go get a dissertation on. I wanted to go f study that. And the roots, are, we, you know, are, the roots of that are sociological. And basically the short answer is um, you need need things in a community that bring people from disparate pockets of the community together in a sustained way to work on a larger goal that they enjoy. When you do that, um, and that's that's different from, you know, just a regular, um, like a book club or a knitting club can do that, as long as it's not... Um, the same group of friends, as long as it's not reinforcing bubbles within the community that are already existing. Mm -hmm. When you're when you're connecting other otherwise disconnected folks by by race, by age, by gender, by um, political values, by whatever, when you're mixing that up, what happens over time, and the best way to explain it is what happens in a choir. You're, you're sitting next to somebody you don't know. Um, if it's one of my choirs, we're doing normally a master work, um, and we're normally doing it with a good 40% of the people in front of me not reading music. And so you have a bunch of people going, oh my God, I have no idea where we are. Do you know where we are? <laughs> I don't know where we are. And then people start laughing and we have a good time. And over six or seven, eight weeks, those people get to know each other separate from any other labels that would normally come when you're meeting somebody yeah. like you meet somebody you know what they're doing in business you know what they're doing this you know where they live or whatever in this environment it's called kind of neutral um for a while and then by the time you find out all those other things it doesn't matter because you already have a sense of who that person is yeah. and what that does is it creates um in sociological terms it creates bridging social capital and rural communities tend to be high in bonding social capital which has a lot of positive effect but for rural communities that ends up being sort of a a charged battery that you can't ever get plugged in. It's the bridging social capital that allows communities the flexibility and the responsiveness because word gets out. Like, and you know, and I, I saw this in the choir. I didn't realize, and I, 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 in the choirs that I've run, but I didn't realize it was going to have such a big economic and socio-political effect in communities, but it's really, really clear. And, you know, you think about it, like people, we had people who were shut-ins in my last choir here who really didn't have much of a social network and suddenly they're getting a knee replaced and the entire choir whether they know that person or not are they're putting together cash rolls they're running errands they're doing whatever that just sort of happens yeah. in these whatever and choirs are not necessarily the only way to do that but the other part of my research shows that one arts participation is the most cost-effective way to do that in communities and of arts participation choral participation is by far the most popular and accessible form of sure. arts participation in the country you can all S sing a little yeah seven out of ten households have a choir singer in them everybody can sing a little so so, so our whole mission is to produce research-based community music programs that are really not about the music as much as they are about the effects they create in the community. And our long-term goal is then to be able to quantify, measure the results of those, and then make those programs available to other communities. So really what we're looking to do is launch a research institute for applied research in community music. And that's what our long-term vision is. Wow. So we're starting with my research, of course, but hopefully in a couple of years, we'll have postdoctoral fellows coming out and spending a year or two figuring out how to apply their research using Mason County as a little bit of a test lab and um, and hopefully in 10 years Mason County is known as a place where other rural communities can come and say hey you know we want to use this sort of out sort of like the Missoula Children's Theater program yeah, yeah. we kind of want an out-of-the-box solution that sort of meets these needs in our community wow. and we want to be able to provide that so Matt Blagan, the director of the Great Bend Chorale, Youth Chorale as well. Find them online, greatbendmusic.org. Sign up for the email list and find links to get the tickets for the uh, performances for Messiah, both in Seattle on the 17th at Plymouth Church and here in Shelton at St. Edward's Catholic Church on the 19th, featuring some top-notch talent from local and from around to, around the area for sure. So, Matt, good to see you. Good Thanks. work you're doing. This Thanks so great. much. Thanks so much. And keep me updated on all the progress. Will do. We'll